Hey everyone, um, apologize for starting late, but thanks for coming uh, to Strength in Numbers. Um, so this is our chance to talk about transparency and transparency reporting. Um, so uh, we've got a great set of panelists here. Um, starting on, on the left, uh, we have Jiwon So uh, from Korea, from Korea Internet Transparency Report, um, which is a, a project at law school there. Um, looking at uh, government transparency reporting, also looking at, at government numbers are um, uh, Jennifer uh, from Hong Kong Transparency Report. Um, to her right is Ben Blink from Google. Um, Google pioneered the process of transparency reporting. Um, and Craig uh, from uh, Frontline, okay. Keyboard Frontline in Hong Kong, um, which is an NGO um, that fights for uh, free expression. Um, and I am Peter Meisek, uh, Policy Council, Senior Policy Council at Access, um, and we uh, uh, run the Transparency Reporting Index. Um, so uh, we really want to make this an interactive session. Um, we've got uh, some questions for you all to work on, but I think we're going to start with uh, some presentations um, to look at what, what um, Juan and Jennifer have been doing in the region. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to give you guys a brief uh, introduction to the transparency reporting in Hong Kong. Um, first, uh, who we are. Uh, we are an independent uh, research uh, project under the Journalism and Media Studies Center, uh, University of Hong Kong. And our project uh, started in 2016, uh, 2013, sorry. And it was funded by Google. Uh, and then we, in 2013, we have a landmark event where the uh, lawmaker Charles Mark uh, asked the Hong Kong government to release the number of user data and the uh, uh, content removal requests uh, made towards the service providers. Uh, such as the uh, online forums, the email service providers, and also the telecom providers. Um, and then the uh, Hong Kong government is uh, quite uh, cooperative. Uh, it released the data, but uh, in the PDF uh, format. Uh, this is the uh, format the Hong Kong government released. Uh, so it's uh, very difficult for the normal, uh, for the online users, uh, ordinary citizens to interpret the data. Uh, the, so, what to, one of our objectives um, is to interpret, analyze, and uh, 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 try to find out the missing data. Uh, then we have a very, in, a very like um, uh, important event last year. I believe many of you noticed, which which is the Occupy Central movement, and um, and uh, then the um, during the movement, which lasted around three months. Um, a lot of uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, speculations over whether the Hong Kong government is uh, monitoring, surveilling the uh, activists, the pro democracy, uh, 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 pro democracy leaders, uh, and the one way uh, to examine it is to uh, is through the how the Hong Kong government access uh, accesses the user data online. Uh, so. Um, uh, following these speculations, the public is very curious to know whether the government is uh, monitoring us and whether government uh, surveillance can be justified and who can uh, the users count on to protect their privacy. Um, then uh, I'd like to uh, introduce why we need uh, transparency reporting. I believe many of you are experts here, so I will just mention this uh, very, very quickly. First, to respect internet users' right to know, uh, such as how the government is um, uh, accessing my online data, such as my IP address, email, uh, email, and the phone logs. And uh, it is also uh, good for the government and the companies to build accountability. And finally, it is a, for, a, a best practice followed by the well-known internet companies like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, etc. Actually, according to Access uh, Transparency Reporting. Uh, index uh, at least 42 companies have engaged in transparency reporting. Um, uh, uh, so this is a brief mention of what should be in, uh, in the transparency report according to the Stockholm principles. Uh, what I want to emphasize uh, here is the content uh, user data access requests and the content uh, takedowns. Uh, so 
Um, uh, so our project is basically divided to two parts. On one hand, we rely on the data released by the government. On the other hand, we also use the Hong Kong's Freedom of uh, Information uh, Code to uh, to request the government to release data. Uh, according to the code, the government is obliged to uh, respond within 21 days. But because there is no law, um, this is the code, so it's not legally binding. So the government sometimes they want to release. And uh, here are the data we analyze. So you can see very clearly, uh, this is the in uh, the three years total government user data requests and counter removal requests made towards the internet and online service providers. Um, um, is and this is um, the yearly an analysis. So you might wonder, like, uh, what uh, uh, law uh, law enforcement agency made such requests? So we also uh, uh, this is the content removal request, such as uh, to remove the web pages, uh, hyperlinks uh, on the website, and uh, this is the um, the request uh, divided by different government departments. As you can see clearly, the biggest number of requests was uh, was issued by the police. And the reasons for the user data request, uh, the, uh, the biggest reason is crime uh, prevention and detection. But uh, the, um, as I will mention, uh, um, as I will mention later, uh, because there is no law in Hong Kong to regulate the law enforcement agency's request, so we have no way to justify whether it is necessary and proper and proper and proportionate. Uh, for the law enforcement agency to uh, request such data. And this is the removal request. Uh, the biggest amount is uh, from the Department of Health. Um, is uh, for the reason is to combat uh, copyright infr infringement. Uh, again, the same reason because no law, so no very seldom the government can justify the, the reasons. Okay, so this is the, what these numbers did not tell us. Apparently, the government released all the data, but uh, according to our analysis, it's not the, uh, the case. Uh, so, mm, as I mentioned, no laws or regulations governing the law enforcement agencies that are or content removal requests. And then there is no independent oversight. So, for instance, uh, according to a lot of forums I've been talking to, um, in a lot of cases, the police officer just made a phone call to the website asking the website to give to give uh, to surrender the user's IP address or the um, to delete the user's uh, online post, which is uh, under no independent examination and there is no um, legal justification. Okay, there is no uh, another big issue is no standard documenting and reporting mechanism by the government agencies. Um, um, for instance, um, our uh, legislator has been made uh, several requests according uh, to as to how many of the government requests were actually filed under court orders, which is a very uh, important way to examine uh, the the uh, the, uh, the legitimacy of the uh, the government request. But the government still refused to tell us the number how many of the user data requests were filed and the court orders and how many uh, for for the police department um the police spokesman actually said they they do not have a standard documenting um mechanism so they have no way to tell us how many of the requests were actually um complied complied with by the service providers okay the government also did not tell us the uh, what kind of requests or metadata, like uh, uh, your IP address, phone logs, email headings, and what kind of data uh, they were requesting uh, uh, as to content, like text messages, email. And, and uh, so this is one of our analysis. The other uh, analysis is um, um, regarding uh, this one, as you can clearly say. Um, the, police, the police, uh, normally the police made a very low number, very small number for content takedowns. But during the, uh, you can see during October 2014 to February this year, the, the total number of the takedowns were, was more than the number in the past four years. So uh, 
there is a legitimate concern by, uh, as to whether the police as a government of, uh, agency is using the takedowns to crack down on the democracy protesters. So um, it's a brief review of the, com of, of the company's practice of for transparency reporting. Because when we talk about transparency reporting, there are two sides. One is the government request data. The other uh, side is whether the companies will stand by the user's privacy, whether uh, the, uh, or just uh, surrender the user data to the, uh, to the government. Um, then we made this um, a graph as to uh, the companies who do business in Hong Kong, uh, how many requests they make, uh, they received from the Hong Kong law enforcement agencies, how many accounts, uh, how many user accounts were affected by the government uh, requests, and the, the number of requests uh, where the, these companies produced some data for the Hong Kong law enforcement agencies. As you can see, um, the, it's very clear like uh, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, and Twitter, they both received a request from the gov law enforcement agencies. And uh, Yahoo was a very, uh, you can say like, um, yeah, uh, it, over 300 uh, users were affected by the, were affected, and uh, but uh, it produced a very small uh, number of data for the law enforcement agencies. Um, so, uh, so for our Hong Kong local companies, like our local uh, telecom providers, broadband providers, uh, internet forums, um, according to our survey, uh, almost none of them have a clear legal guidelines as to how to respond to government requests. For instance, uh, whether they require subpoena or call orders um, um, to uh, for the government to access the user data, and uh, they don't have a clear transparency reporting mechanism. Um, so we cannot help but wonder uh, how can users trust these companies in handling their online data if they are not very transparent uh, as to their practice of dealing with the government user data requests. Um, okay, so um, this is basically my presentation. Uh, presentation, And I'd like to invite you guys to think uh, what's our next step to uh, to protect user privacy and uh, to promote the practice of transparency reporting. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Joan Son from South Korea Internet Transparency Reporting Team of Korea University Law Schools. Clinical Legal Education Center. It's an um, honor to be invited to such a meaningful event. I would like to introduce the current status of internet censorship and surveillance and its transparency in South Korea. Our project began last July. We found out that internet transparency reporting on the national level has been conducted in Hong Kong. And we thought such research is also necessary in Korea to effectively inform people about the status of Korea government's censorship and surveillance on the internet. We are conducting this pro reporting project with financial from Google. In Korea, a total population of about 50 million, about 100,000 online contents are blocked yearly by an administrative body, KCSC, uh, on the issue of internet surveillance. Each year, about 2,000 accounts were wiretapped, and the communication metadata of about 200,000 accounts, and the subscriber identifying information of about 600,000 accounts was provided to the law enforcement agencies. The number of such seizure on the communication service providers, which can acquire all of communication contents, metadata, and identification is not disclosed yet, but we roughly estimate that over 2 million accounts were surveilled through such and seizure based on the recent transparency report of two major domestic portals. This is for the internet only. If we include the figures of all sorts of communication, the numbers are going to be much larger. It's about 
10 million accounts, almost 20% of total population's communication metadata or subscriber identifying information is provided to law enforcement. Because the scale of Korean government's internet censorship and surveillance is so immense, acknowledging the citizens of the such seriousness through uh, transparency reporting on the national level is very necessary. Uh, however, the Korean government discloses some of the relevant figures to the public. Uh, KCSB, the censorship body, qu quarterly releases the number of contents blocking or deleting decisions and rough reasons for those decisions. And the public can monitor the semi-weekly meetings of KCSC's deliberation, although I'm the, I'm the only person who monitor. <laughs> On the case of surveillance, the government discloses the total number of wiretapping and provision of uh, communication metadata and subscriber identifying information, which is reported from service provider to the government twice a year. Uh, our report provides an analysis of the data disclosed by the government and relevant articles through the website. Also, we are requiring more data which the government is not disclosing, such as such as CISA data and reasons and ranges of surveillance through the filing FOIA request and cooperating with the members of parliament. And for the sensor, we are monitoring the case assessment deliberation and reporting problematic, problematic cases to the press. In fact, it's hard to say that Korean citizens are interested in the subject. But recently, there were several cases revealing the seriousness of excessive surveillance on the online messenger. One of them is that the online messages of left-wing parties, vice president was surveilled through the search and seizure on the servers of such provider. In this case, not only the, the account of the target of investigation, but also the account's data of the opposite party of the conversation was provided, which counts over 2,000. After revealing those cases, public's attention to transparency reporting increases. Although it's not a big attention yet, that this trend led to the first transparency report of domestic major portals uh, and legislation requiring the transparency report from the company and the government was recently proposed. Uh, that's all my short introduction of status in Korea. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm Ben Blink um, from Google. I'm based in our Washington, D.C. office. Normally, uh, I'm in Hong Kong for, for uh, three months uh, right around this time right now. Um, so we started transparency reporting at Google uh, in 2010. Uh, it was in response, basically, to two trends that were happening at the same time. Uh, one, we were getting more requests for user data than we were before. We saw a definite uptick in both user data and in demands by governments to remove content. And there was just more interest from the public about what was actually happening and how things and how both we were handling these and um, the number of requests that were coming from their respective governments. Um, at the time, made the decision that let's just make it public uh, because we realized that we did not have very much leverage in terms of pushing back in certain circumstances because the public just wasn't aware exactly of, of what the processes look like, um, the scale of the requests, and for what reasons governments were making both of these types of requests. Um, so we publish a report, a publicly available site. Uh, it's available now at google.com slash transparency report. Um, and we started with it, just a couple of categories. We broke out requests for user data and requests for um, to remove content. And we broke it out by country so people could see specifically uh, which governments were requesting more. Um, and over time, as we, we've released data every six months since. 
Um, and the each time we try and have some sort of innovation in the report itself to give people more information. Um, so we started off uh, with just the numbers. We moved to the legal process. So whether it was a subpoena or a court order, um, we moved to even more granular details uh, in the countries. Um, there was a there was some big gaps in the data, frankly, especially on the use of requests in the United States. Um, specific laws, including national security letters and uh, orders issued under the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, did not allow us to publicly disclose that information. Um, we lobbied uh, the De Department of Justice and several others, uh, members of Congress as well, to get their support. And we're finally able to say now that yes, the transparency report is comprehensive in terms of the requests we get. Um, everything that we're getting in, we are reporting in our transparency report um, for those for, for user data requests. The categories are all there. Um, as we have moved uh, on over time, I think the biggest, the, the last big uh, gap was, um, well, actually the Vodafone transparency report was really revolutionary. Um, other companies have done some really great stuff and innovated that we're now chasing, trying to provide that level of access. Uh, Vodafone, when they published their transparency report, had very detailed legal process about how they see jurisdiction and other things. Um, and in our latest transparency report that we released, we were very specific in how we think about uh, the legal process, both in the US and outside the US. Um, the goal here is, that, is to increase user trust from a, from a business perspective. The more users can see this information, presumably the more trust they'll have in our services that they know how Google is handling their data on, on that side. Um, and you know, honestly, the next step, I think companies have really pushed the boundaries on this in, in many, many regards and have been leading um, with support of civil society, of course, but ultimately we want governments to be doing this reporting themselves. Um, it's a much more ideal situation. You can look at Google or Facebook's transparency report and see what they're making. You know, they could make 100 requests to Google, they could be making 10,000 requests to another company, and you just don't know that. Um, and if our law enforcement agencies around the world were publishing that data themselves in the same way they think about uh, open records requests or other things. Citizens would have a much better appreciation for exactly how these law enforcement processes were affecting their privacy, their freedom of expression. Um, I think that's the, the next place that we need to really push things. Thanks, Craig. Um, hi, I, I'm Craig Choi uh, from Hong Kong, and I'm from this uh, organization called uh, Keyboard for Life. And uh, we established in the year 2011, and mainly fighting for the internet freedom in Hong Kong. And uh, I just walked out from the another conference uh, talking about open data in the Southeast Asia. And I learned that uh, the, quite a lot of uh, Southeast Asia countries, they, also, they already have this uh, Open Data uh, Act or the Freedom to Information Act. But sadly, in Hong Kong, we don't even have this kind of law, and only have the code to govern the government to do that, and it's, it's not even legally binding. So it's quite difficult for um, the citizens in Hong Kong to uh, uh, request the government to, to surrender their information. And they, usually they would try to make out a lot of excuses to, you know, to stop us from obtaining the data from the government as well. And uh, apart from that, uh, actually in Hong Kong, they talk quite a lot of uh, um, ISP or OSP or the uh, internet platform and they don't even have the privacy statement that is quite surprising when we uh, try to look for their uh, privacy statement or terms of terms of conditions and then they don't even have that and they didn't even tell us uh, um, how how they would handle the data or how what kind of information they 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 they, they would give to the government and uh, even more surprisingly is that um, they request quite a lot of information from this forum as well and uh, apart from your name, your telephone number, they also ask you about the, the, your hobbies, your families, or, or whether you're married or not, or your, your salary, everything. And I, I believe that actually they're doing it because of the uh, marketing purposes. But uh, at the same time, when, they, when the government comes to them and requesting that they use this information, we wonder what kind of information that they are giving out to them. And then they usually then we ask them, oh, what kind of information you are giving to the government? And then they said that they, they can't tell us because uh, they are afraid that the government will come to them and think that they're, they're perverting the cause of public justice because uh, usually the government authority will, will say that uh, they're doing it because of detection of crime and they couldn't uh, you know, disclose information at this stage. 
And uh, apart from that, I, as Jennifer, Jennifer has said that um, some of the police would just give a call to the companies and then they try to, you know, fish for the information without, you know, following the, the proper procedure as well. It's actually quite common. And because uh, the police will think that, oh, um, since you are only surrounding it uh, voluntarily, then it's, you know, they have already obtained your consent by conduct. And so uh, it's quite outrageous actually, because uh, the, gov the government or the police should follow the procedure or at least to apply for a warrant or a subpoena to you for the information. And, uh, and in, I mean, in, in, in Hong Kong, it's like uh, 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 quite a lot of companies, they, they do not, they are not like Google or the Yahoo, they're big companies, they always have the legal team to support them. Quite a lot of these ISP, they don't have the legal team to support them. That's why whenever they come to um, the government, they try, when the government tries to request the information, they will just, you know, I'll, I'll just give it to you to save, save time and save money. And uh, that's one of the, one of the um, problems or difficulties that the small companies that may, that may face. And uh, another problem for the netizens is that, uh, the, or the general public, people don't know what this uh, transparency report can benefit them. And they don't know why the company is trying to release that and how could they use it as well. So uh, I, I would say that uh, probably the next step would be the public education that to the general public, how we can utilize this uh, transversal report or to give the government some pressure that they shouldn't request some information so randomly. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Well, I think we've, uh, yeah, <laughs> round of applause. Um, I think we've gotten some great, uh, some great ideas out there. Um, you know, people have raised the, uh, the reporting by governments and the reporting by companies, and um, how those might strengthen each other. Um, we've seen uh, the links between civil society and academia, and uh, and uh, government reporting. Um, and I think we've uh, we've seen that there's uh, some problems around uh, business models and uh, data protection standards um, in terms of the the corporate collection of data. Um, and government access to that data. Um, I, if we can get a, a show of hands from the audience, um, just an idea of uh, how many of you work with uh, open data or government data um, in your work? A few people. Great. Oh, there's some hands. Um, how many of you have read transparency reports by companies? Good. Um, and uh, transparency data. Um, collected uh, by governments um, and, and produced through uh, some, some of these NGO reports. Great. Well, we've got um, a few questions we wanted to pose um, to you all uh, to get you thinking um, about how these uh, reports could be improved, how they could be used, and how they can be used um, to uh, produce more government transparency. Um, so. Uh, First, uh, I want to do want to put it out to you. Do you have any questions uh, in response to the uh, panelists? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's more for Google or just in one international company in general that are paying based overseas from the from the company they're based. And when you give the transparency report, you might see them listed from the government, but do you receive them directly, or does it go from the local office like trust? How how similar it is in terms of the request? You're saying if if a if a government is making a request of Google, how do they? They say this in Malaysia. Did it go to the local um, office or did it go directly to the US? Like, what's the difference? Yeah, so I'm sure companies are different on how they handle these types of requests. We have a web form that's available. So we, the, the requests, I mean, frankly, the requests could come in many forms. Some of them mail them. They may come to a local office. Ultimately, they get funneled to a central team based in California who has the legal expertise, who is separate from the political pressures that our individual teams may face in different places, and they can specifically assess those types of those, those requests. Um, for the most part, content, like the actual content of communications, that needs to go through a mutual legal assistance process that goes through the United States government. Um, so that's a little bit slightly, slightly different. Um, but yeah, again, the requests can come in by mail. We, we try and point people towards the web form because that's the, the best way to do it. Um, but uh, they all get sent to California in the end. Do you 
watch the, the meetings by video or is it special? But uh, can monitor dialects in, in the campus room or CCTV. And, but there are uh, issues, there are issues of the privacy, like, uh, like sexual, pri private persons, sexual uh, movie is, uh, um, uh, is disclosed, is not disclosed to the public. So, sorry, I'm not fluent in English. So, <laughs> anyone else? Yeah, that's question for anyone on the panel, really. So, Google started the trend on transparency reporting. Many companies and governments have followed. At what extent does it, is there a need to have standardization in terms of how numbers are reported? Is that a problem uh, that needs resolving or not? And are there any efforts underway to have similar protocols so that we can actually compare numbers to each other? I'm not clear to the extent to which that's even a problem, so I'd love to get your take. And that can be for any member of the panel because you're all involved in transparency reporting. I'll kick it off and then others can answer. Um, so I've definitely heard that concern many times uh, from civil society groups and others who want to be able to make meaningful comparisons of what, what this data looks like. Um, and I mean, frankly, to, to, as far as I know, there hasn't been a, a ton of collaboration between companies on a, lo a lot of this stuff. Um, there probably could be a lot more um, to make things a little bit more standardized. Uh, our approach is just to be, try and be as clear as possible in terms of the, the, the uh, definitions of the data that we're using. So we're talking about users slash accounts. We actually define that so people know. Um, the other issue is, frankly, is that our services are all super different. So what Google does is very different than the service that Facebook provides or even comparisons between Google and Yahoo, we operate very differently. Um, so to make it something where you can just download one spreadsheet and have meaningful data to compare is, is uh, really tough. Um, the area where you can make it a lot more standardized is with governments. I mean, they can tell you specifically how many requests they're making to ICT companies, um, what type of data they're demanding, whether it's personal communication content or those types of things. I think there's the opportunity for more standardization in a lot of this. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I actually think that the transparency report should break down into different um, uh, authorities from the government because uh, when when you can see from the transparency, transparency report that if it's from police, probably it will be criminal, but if it's from the custom, then probably it will be copyright infringement. I, I mean, at least in Hong Kong situation. And then if it's from the some um, uh, uh, like uh, the stock market authority, then it would be something about the commercial crime. And at least we will, from a reader point of view, then I can figure out what, what kind of um, information that uh, the, the company is uh, surrendering and uh, what, which of government authorities they are trying to, you know, uh, requesting the information in this regard. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, standardization of, and looking for a common baseline is something that access is, um, is certainly in favor of. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether that can happen across different countries since uh, legal regimes vary so much. Um, and, you know, we're working with partners to, to try and understand how that can happen. And I think, but I think as, as the numbers um, do get simply a baseline at, at one company, and they will get more valuable over time to show trends. Um, and uh, trends that can be mapped against you know, different political and legal changes in, in, um, in countries. Uh, yeah, question number. Um, I was just going to ask, as a government employee, how clear the situation is that governments need to provide that sort of information. So in the UK, we have independent commissioners who uh, hopefully uh, take steps and things like that. They do publish annual reports to say, this is how many we do this message, and this is the number that we found that's problematic in the country. But, um, Right, so yeah, the, the question is about you know, whether governments can be trusted um, to report accurate data. And I would just add, 
Now, there is a, a, a divide sometimes, uh, especially in the U.S., between uh, national security um, requests um, or even takedowns in that case and requests on um, from you know traditional law enforcement or crime fighting or copyright enforcement authority. I, I, I wouldn't say that I can trust my government because uh, it's not the government that uh, elected through democracy in Hong Kong. But at the same time, I, I, I mean, when, when we look at the legal framework in Hong Kong is that we don't have an a information uh, uh, law or, or the Open Data Act like other countries in Southeast Asia. And the thing is that they only have, we only have a core of practice. So uh, I, I think there is absolutely there is some, there, there, there's need to have a, a you know a, a law or a, an act to govern this kind of um, um, government behavior so that uh, we can tell that uh, the government is correct in providing the data. So I would say that in Hong Kong nowadays only a core practice is not enough. Great. So definitely some skepticism, but some some hope too for for a legislative move. Um, you know, since this question is about government, um, we'd love to get any government representatives um, in the room, including uh, Mr. Mock, I think, who just arrived. <laughs> no. Sure. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Charles Mock. Uh, I'm a legislator in Hong Kong, uh, and uh, I certainly don't represent the government. Actually, I'm on the opposition. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but uh, I also, of course, I have actually happened to be the person in Hong Kong who actually uh, requested the government to give these numbers starting three years ago. And for the last three years, they've been uh, giving us some numbers that Craig doesn't seem to trust very much. Uh, but uh, but I don't, actually, I don't think the numbers the big issue because uh, whether or not the numbers are real, uh, first of all, it does give us a little bit of a, a, a trend, you know, year on year. You know whether the, the the number of access or the number of removal requests uh, has been increasing or decreasing. Of course, it's been increasing. Uh, and uh, but I think uh, it's more important uh, that we try as much as we can to hold the government responsible by having either civil society or uh, your legislators, your your congressmen, and so on to try to ask those questions from your government to try to get that, those answers. Uh, because it's strange that, you know, we've been trying to tell the companies to be transparent, whereas uh, our government actually is not very transparent. Of course, it's, it's uh, a little bit to my surprise that, you know, three years ago, two and a half years ago, when I asked the government in Hong Kong to provide those information, they actually did provide us, did provide us with, uh, you know, at least the numbers. But of course, they didn't tell us the details of those cases, uh, which is the real problem, which is what Craig mentioned. You know, I wouldn't go into the details, but there are a number of these cases that we've been trying to get more details on and the government for a long, long time just wouldn't give us any, 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 any answer. So what's, what's in the number? They can give us the number, fine. Uh, but uh, so I totally agree with Craig that we need a uh, uh, law that would uh, enforce governments to uh, archive and then to release those uh, government-related data and information to us, but uh, but finally, yeah, I do really uh, agree. I really think that you know we should still hold governments responsible. It's in the same ways that probably in other sessions today and tomorrow we would be talking about holding the companies responsible as well. And then once you know, if companies give us certain data about governments, you know, why wouldn't government give us those data as well? And one last point, uh, actually in Hong Kong. Uh, to the to a little bit of credit to the government, they actually give us detailed uh, of details of these numbers uh, by department. So uh, so uh, I would say while I don't quite believe the numbers of some of the departments like police or, or and so on, but uh, there are you know you could actually find other trends in other departments that you never would think of as you know asking for. Mm -hmm your ISPs to remove or uh, uh, content and so on. And then they turned out to be the ones that they are actually quite cre quite frequently remove, asking ISPs to remove content. So those kind of information, I think, are useful too. I mean, uh, but of course, you know, Jennifer can tell you about all the difficulties of, you know, how we can, we, you know, researchers like, that, like them in Hong Kong U have been trying to get further details 
deeper into the numbers and uh, and then we'll be getting into a, a stone wall. Yeah, that's all I can say. Thank you. Well, picking up on that point of, of um, you know, how we can uh, put governments um, under the uh, uh, pressure to release more data and more useful and meaningful data and qualitative data, um, I would actually want to ask you on, um, since uh, there was a public outcry in Korea, there's a lot of demand um, from users to understand how the government was accessing their data um, and companies uh, very much came out um, in favor of, of greater transparency, but also um, greater ability to, to push back against those government requests. Um, have, have you, as a, as a civil society and academic researcher, have you worked with the companies? Have you um, developed any sort of common strategy to, um, to uh, increase government transparency? I've never worked with a specific company. Um, just uh, we are, our purpose is that uh, inform the government's uh, censorship and surveillance and appropriate. So I think uh, how we can make the government uh, transparent and I think it's a legislation that can make government disclose such data. Although KCSC is rel relatively cooperative to with with with, uh, with me, and data regarding surveillance it would not be easy to receive because it's a confidentiality related to the crime investigation. So uh, it seems to be hard that leading the government's voluntary disclosing. I think we need to lead legislation or lawsuit or cooperating with member of parliament who can pressure the government in the parliamentary inspection. It's, it's the important thing. Um, any other ideas on how uh, you know, civil society and, and maybe corporations and, uh, and academics can work together um, to increase transparency? So I think the one place to start is the areas where the requests are most centralized. So for example, like national security letters in the United States are pretty much run by the FBI. And when you can make, when you can identify specific agencies or others who are, who are making requests that is of great interest to the public, you can start in those specific areas that make it easier. You know, if we want to find out every single, you know, what all the police across a large country are asking, that's an incredible lift and it's going to take a lot. So I think the more specific we can get, identify what is in the public interest that's most helpful. Um, and then if we can make our first ask to a specific government agency where it's most centralized, where those requests come from, I think that's kind of where we get our first wins on this. And then as the public recognizes the value of that type of transparency, it's easier to ask for some of those uh, transparency requests where it's there's much more government bureaucracy that needs to get together to actually make that happen. Right, so don't see governments as one monolithic entity, but, um, but rather a, a number of different departments at different levels. Um, so I, yeah, I had another question for, for Jennifer. I was wondering um, you know, what uh, reforms you see that would increase uh, the public trust and um, perhaps the oversight of um, the, the government surveillance, but also the, just the data that's being released um, is there anything in your mind that um, would, help, would help you to trust that data? You, you pointed out a few different gaps in, uh, in what's being released, but is there any particular data that would help? 
Um, well, I think because one of the um, uh, problems I just pointed out is the um, uh, lack of uh, independent oversight uh, because the police, the law enforcement agencies, the uh, for I think for the past in the past four years, um, they never gave us an exact number of how many requests were done under court orders. So we have uh, no way to know what uh, kind of uh, um, mechanisms are examining um, examine the, uh, the government's requests. So I think it would be really great if the government can disclose how many, uh, how many requests were done under court orders. Mm -hmm. Also, another thing is, um, uh, as uh, Craig just mentioned, um, uh, this transparency reporting is uh, relatively new in Hong Kong for, I, I mean, for ordinary, uh, internet um, users. So if the uh, internet users can uh, realize how important it is to have the right to know what what is happening to their online data, then they will might they might they can start like pressuring the government, pressuring their their service providers to release transparency reports. Great. Um, you know, I would like to ask Ben, you know, you said that um, Google began uh, reporting this data in part to um, enhance the, the trust of users um, in, in uh, your ability to keep their private information safe and to, um, to protect it. So um, do you have any metrics to, to, to understand how um, that goal has been achieved? And um, in your mind, you know, what types of feedback do you get and, and has it been successful to date? Yeah, it's tough to measure. I mean, yeah. the, the fact that the, the request, the number of requests has gone up so dramatically, that's, you know, right. we were thinking that maybe, uh, at least some of us were thinking that if we show this stuff, then maybe people will be discouraged from submitting as many requests. That's turned out to be very false. Um, you know, I think one good case study is there was a country that we were working with who saw our data and insisted that it was incorrect. It was like, it was a minister level official has said, it's through me that all these requests come, that's not happened. You know, we, we have not been making this request. And unbeknownst to him, there was a different agency that was making requests of companies for user data that he didn't know about. Um, so it was a specific instance where the company transparency reports are helping governments keep their own houses in order um, because there are requests that are happening that they didn't even know about. Um, so I can only imagine what would happen if they actually started getting together and actually having conversations about these types of um, requests and their, their procedures. Um, but to me, I think that's the most stark example of a specific win that we've gotten um, in terms of government process around transparency. And, um, you know, what kind of uh, feedback would users like to give? Um, you know, how, how have the reports been useful to you in your own advocacy? And uh, you know, how could uh, companies or, or governments, I guess, make them more useful? Um, I think uh, really the key here is, is to make them effective. Oh, I was just going to say that's great. That's not much of what Kelly talked about. It's really useful that you guys in the UK. I don't know. I've had no idea. No, I'm, sorry. I'm not sure if they actually did get together to oh, talk right. about it, but okay. um, he knew that there was something wrong. We could we could point to the, the area where it was happening. We run a platform a lot, and I think that's really important because the level of things that exactly we're not on the organization. Yeah. You know, I work for one part of the government. I work with the kids because I don't want to talk to the kids because I don't want to talk to them because I don't want to talk to them. I don't see what's going on in all these different areas. So it is actually really important for you to see numbers like that and understand where they're coming from. Which corrupts across the board is really important in that it has a lot of a really long term phase of kids still figuring out who has to get access to what. So it's a really good point for me because I just think it's so important that we need to all be going forward and that's got the whole range of people. Sure. Okay. government sector only uh, departments. Maybe if we have a critical mass of transparency reports, we can have these people check each other. Like there could be a, a, a centralized um, checksum uh, website that makes sure, okay, right. um, the reports coming from this country are distributed to these uh, companies, and these companies' reports, total of the, the records, records of that country, they should be equal to each other. So if we can get a critical mass of companies and uh, governments reporting their privacy data, then I'll be good. 
Great. So a system of checks and balances. Um, you know, that reminds me that the extractive sector has a, a transparency index that works very much in that way. It's it's called publish what you pay, and it's about um, like governments um, reporting all the payments they receive from companies, and companies reporting all the payments that they make to governments. And in an ideal world, those would match up. Um, yeah. Any response uh, to what we've heard? Yeah, I think that uh, Craig actually mentioned earlier that um, many times you don't even know the, the privacy policies of the companies or how they process um, your data. And that's, um, I think, one thing that we've seen in transparency reports is the data may be the, the, co the core or draw you know, the headlines, but um, companies can also use these to, to expound their policies, to um, draw attention to new positions, or even to, to just um, you know, establish their brand. I saw, um, we noted that uh, Cheeseburger, the, the website, uh, listed the, the karaoke songs that, um, that they sang at their Christmas party. It's very transparent. More ideas? Thanks. Uh, yeah. So small and medium-sized enterprises may not have the, the capacity um, and they're not the lawyers on staff necessarily. Um, and uh, there should be more tools for them to, uh, to be able to take part in this conversation.
And I, I think it's, it should be part of the procedure that after a, a case is cleared or a crime has been solved, um, the, there is also a reporting that is uh, connected to that report. So there is a metric that we can measure. Because we don't know, like, all we know now is these many requests were made. But we don't know, like, how many criminals were caught or how many crimes were solved. Possibly, like, they made 200 million requests and that's just too much. <laughs> and, like, or maybe they did 15 requests and they caught, like, 15 sexual predators and that's a huge return. So I, I'm thinking, how, how do we measure the return on these requests? Oh. Raises a lot of uh, questions. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to respond immediately? Um, I'll, I'll say something really quickly. So I can imagine law enforcement who would be just kind of bristling at that idea. Um, the idea of having to be accountable for the type of information because it would then, if they could need it later or they think it could help it later, if there's some sort of deterrent from them asking for that. I'm sure that that's, that's kind of a creepy idea. But I think in the US specifically, there are two great examples of this that are coming out right now. One is with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We have some members in the intelligence community saying this information is essential. You have members of Congress who are saying there's no credible cases where you can demonstrate that those types of demands or those orders actually influenced investigations. I think those types of questions are exactly the right ones. The next area where this is gonna be very prevalent soon is encryption and the ways in which companies encrypt their data, whether or not that encryption is inhibiting law enforcement uh, investigations. And I think having a very tangible uh, numbers-based, but also narrative-based approach as to when this is helpful and when it's not, is going to help inform us as to how we should address those specific challenges. And uh, Google is reporting a little bit about encryption of your networks um, in the transparency report. Um, do you plan to do more of that? Um, I, I think right now it, it mainly refers to, to one product, right? Yeah. Well, we do the safer email, I think. That, yeah. Yeah, essentially figuring out how much of our outgoing email, our outgoing encrypted email is being received by on the other side by encrypted um, encryption in the way, because it goes both ways. Um, so there's been instances in the past where just highlighting that discrepancy can encourage other providers of that type of service to bump up their standards as well. Um, so that's just one way. But I mean, yeah, we're always open for new ideas of ways to improve the transparency report or, uh, yeah, new information there. Any other companies in the room want to talk about their innovations in transparency? Thanks, Chaos. I also like to talk about the uh, the power of different authorities under the law as well, because uh, at least in the Hong Kong situation, that uh, different authorities they have different power when they uh, where they can go to request information from the company. So, so uh, basically, for example, like the police, they have to get a warrant, but at the same time, like the privacy com commissioner, 
they can go to the company and then make a re request and under the, the, the reason that they're doing the detection of law. But what is det uh, detection of crime? But do they have a specific um, offense in mind? Does it require that they have to have this specific offense in mind? It doesn't really say so. So whenever they come to when when whenever they come to the company, they just said, oh, we're doing the detection of crime," and it's a very general term. But uh, what about if the police uh, power under their, their under the law? If the, because they have to have a warrant, so they have a specific uh, offense. So uh, in different situation, when they come uh, when the government authorities come into the company, probably they're only doing an inquiries of of the information or the, whether they are detection of crime or whether they have a specific uh, offense in their mind. That may be a different level of uh, uh, request. So uh, maybe it would be good that we, in the transparency report that we can show that as well. Yeah, so companies have uh, often use their transparency reports to say that they'll only respond um, to requests that are given to them for a proper legal reason, through proper legal process, written, et cetera. Um, so that can be a good way to uh, to force more accountability um, as well as transparency. Have you seen any instances with that already? Where you have like, um, as to how you could make a case more clear that you will go or can you all just do it in Uh, this is actually an obstacle we have in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, we recent, uh, we are conducting a what happens to your data uh, survey, and um, according to a few uh, forums we've been talking to, uh, they do not want to be the first one to eat the crab. <laughs> Strength in numbers is the name of the panel. Yeah, and I think that uh, might be the case. Um, not every company can take the step that Google took. And, be the first, right? but uh, there has been yeah, some change in Korea recently. Um, I think Kakao, the biggest messaging app in the country, um, released a great transparency report. It has awesome visuals and uh, it really um, promote everyone to take a look at that. Charles? Just a very quick comment about this question and actually also a previous question, I think, uh, because uh, we're, we've been talking also about surveillance. In uh, my observation about the laws in Hong Kong, uh, actually physical searches or even surveillance in the older sense of the words, you know, you know, having a binocular across the, the street and trying to to, to, to watch over somebody, wiretapping on the telephone and so on. Those kind of things are very strictly uh, regulated. We have an uh, ordinance in Hong Kong that is almost 10 years old called interception of uh, communications and surveillance ordinance that uh, an independent judge uh, has a commission that the police and other law enforcement agency, if they are uh, doing this sort of things, they have to file reports, they have to apply and then subsequently they have to file a report every year the commissioner the, the judge would uh, issue a report stating the uh, violation cases and so on and suggest areas of improvements and so on so uh, that's the traditional surveillance now it comes to the internet uh, when we asked the commissioner last year what about things that's been happening on the internet are they considered to be surveillance basically his answer to us is i don't know and in the meantime, we see the police and other people and other law enforcement agencies being very liberal in trying to get uh, information from service providers. We call them uh, requests for data. You could call them surveillance as well. 
we call them deletion uh, requests. You could call them surveillance as well. So that is the problem. Now, the problem also is that uh, when we come to establishing laws to try to regulate these kind of activities, my worry is that the global trend right now is setting up cybersecurity laws that are going to enforce, give police even more power rather than the other way around. And that is the double-edged sword that we face. You know, we keep on telling the government, we, have, we see these problems, we think you should review the law. But we know in the back of our mind that uh, there's a certain risk that we're taking when we tell the government to review the laws because they might go the other way. So that, that is unfortunately, it seems like with the global, you know, worries about all these kind of terrorism and other law, uh, crime, you know, police can easily show us crime figures that, you know, oh, the crime fraud on the internet has been growing, you know, uh, 50, 80% a year. Of course, you know, they don't do it on the cell phone anymore. So, but, but then again, you know, it's easy for them to use these kind of uh, worries and public worries and so on to try to, you know, enforce even stricter if they have a cybersecurity law. That, that's the dilemma that I face all the time. You know, do I tell the government to do a review? Because I know once they do it, it might come out even worse than right now, where there's just a bit of uncertainty and we try to navigate around the uncertainty. But once it's very certain, it might be even worse. I don't know. So that's the problem. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Great. Um, just a couple more questions. Yeah, you in the standing up. So in terms of the trends of what the Iranian government is doing, I, I don't have the insights or the specifics about what, what uh, they're doing. I know there's a lot of experts here focused on Iran and, and that type of technology and who I'm sure could, could help out. So in terms of specifics like that, I just don't have the details on, on the specifics of what the Iranian government is doing. I'm happy to find that out for you. Um, and in terms of the questions about the sanctions, that's again, not, it's not really my core area of expertise, um, but there are, I work with many folks in the DC office and in California who are focused on those issues and happy to um, get some satisfactory answers uh, after this. Thanks. Yeah, I think there are great questions about um, companies deciding to enter markets and, and perhaps uh, factoring in how transparent they'll be able to be about what happens in those markets once they're, once they're there. Um, I think we've uh, just running out of time. I just want to give our panelists one last chance um, to uh, perhaps uh, produce some outcomes or um, yeah, requests from the audience. Uh, okay, I think I got a um, lot of great feedbacks from the audience, especially when uh, some mentioned that uh, we cannot only, uh, we need to search uh, for deep meaning from the numbers. The numbers cannot tell us all. And uh, some audience uh, 
give us a very good uh, suggestions to as to uh, request the proportions of uh, the um, the cases where the the law enforcement the law enforcement agencies can actually um, um, like uh, crack some cases because of the data they requested. Um, I think these are very great advice. I just like to tell the, uh, how many companies can involve the transparency report. Uh, there is the limitation pushing them to perform their social responsibility, I think. Yeah. So that is a good way too, but companies, companies uh, they move by benefit. So, so we make them able to feel the consumer's criticism for that, before that. Uh, we have to make the public interested in the transparency of company first. Uh, for that, we disclose not only number, but also cases. It's effective way that finding and inform the cases which revealing the seriousness of excessive surveillance or censorship in appropriate censor. When it comes to the individual problem, which probably can feel uh, I might be the target of the inappropriate surveillance, it can attract public attention easily, I think. In Korea, after revealing the messenger surveillance cases, I mentioned it before, that there were many people who moved to overseas messenger Taliban, which is known as that doesn't save conversation on their server. Uh, this, this move like this uh, can companies uh, can, can brought companies uh, transparency reporting practice. I think. Thank you. Thanks. I think for me the the big takeaway, which I really appreciated, uh, was the, um, the the fact that the narrative is so much more helpful than just the raw numbers are oftentimes. And I think you know we just released our. Uh, legal process section in our transparency report. I think that's when people were like, ah, I get it now. I feel more comfortable with how this process works. Um, and I think us developing that section and for other companies, I'm sure we'll be doing the same, um, should be kind of our next focus as opposed to just breaking out numbers even more. Um, I, I think apart from the general public, we also have to promote it among the companies as well and telling them that actually if they release a transparency report, then they will attract more users that they can trust them. Yeah, I, only in that way they can earn, earn more money and if that will be their own only drive to you know reduce the transparency report yeah thank you. that's great yeah and um, just to follow up i'd love to see companies make the business case for transparency to show um you know their investors um the shareholders and, and their peers um just how important it is to uh to release this data and this narrative um so one last plug i'd like to say um access is transparency reporting index um, has been just newly revamped with the help of Anchi, and um, we'll uh, put these flyers out um, with some of the data. Um, so if we can all thank the panelists. Thank you all.